Okay, so uh, thanks for staying with me through the trauma of phase diagrams and, um, you know, just to, just to kind of lighten it up at the end, we're just going to go and talk about Hawaii um, and look at some pretty pictures and hopefully uh, this will be a little easier. So yeah, Hawaii, um, isn't it gorgeous? Um, this is, uh, this is just a sunset photo from uh, the top of Haleakala, which is a big volcano in Maui, um, which is one of the islands in Hawaii. Um, also got a picture from before the sunset uh, of a lovely scoria cone. Um, all of you last week looked at that kind of really air-filled basaltic sample, and I, I mentioned there was a scoria, kind of a mafic version of a pumice, and that's what these tend to look like. You get these little blob-shaped cones and they're just erupting this really vesicular basalt. Um, there's also obviously a ton of recent lava flows on Hawaii. Um, this picture on the left is uh, Pahoehoe lava flow lobes. So that's also like one of the uh, samples you saw where it had those kind of like ropey bands. And you can see on the right, this is just a bit more like, you know, zoomed out so you can see it's a recent lava flow field. And this is all coming from uh, Kilauea on the big island. Uh, the brown stuff there is seems to be a really recent flow. It looks kind of blocky, so it's probably one of these RR flows that's uh, kind of crumbling as it goes. Right now, uh, Mauna Loa is erupting. That has been in the news a lot. Um, yeah, and Mauna Loa is the biggest volcano on Earth. Um, it's, I think it's something like 4,600 meters tall. But the reason people t talk about it as being the biggest volcano is that it basically expand, it extends all the way down to the seabed, which is something like 4,000 meters below sea level. So the Mauna Loa from bottom to top is nearly 10 kilometers. So this is an absolutely massive volcano. Um, it's mainly basalt, which is why it's got that cool glowing color and it's just nice thin flows, nothing super dangerous. I think it's gonna hit the highway um, that goes past Mauna Loa. So it'll be a bit uh, obnoxious for drivers around there, but no one's gonna die, hopefully. Uh, yeah, so all of that, I think we, we can all agree there's volcanoes in Hawaii, right? Yeah. Um, so it begs the question, why are there volcanoes in, in Hawaii? So you can see in the picture on the right that we're actually really far from any plate boundary. We're right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So this is something that we call intraplate magnetism, right? It's within a plate. Um, it's also in very old lithosphere. It's about 100 million years old there. So if you think back to what we talked about in the first lecture, the lithosphere, and we're talking here about the thermal lithosphere, it gets thicker as you cool away from mid-ocean ridge. So close to mid-ocean ridge, the lithosphere is very, very thin because the plates are separating. Um, as, you, as the uh, oceanic lithosphere moves away from that plate boundary, it basically thickens out as it gets colder. So if we kind of circle, we said that Hawaii is about 100 million years old, so the lithosphere should be about 90 kilometers thick. Um, and this is actually what, what we see under Hawaii. So if we have thick lithosphere and we have normal temperature mantle. Um, so in this diagram here, it's the same one I showed you in the first lecture about melting under mid-ocean ridges. And this is a temperature we have at a typical mid-ocean ridge. It's about 1300 degrees C potential temperature. Remember that's that way of comparing temperatures from different parts of the mantle. And if we follow this adiabat, this line of cooling as it decompresses up, we hit thick oceanic lithosphere, 90 kilometers thick, it's about three gigapascals. We hit it and we've not crossed the solidus, so it doesn't melt at all. So basically, if we had normal temperature mantle coming up under Hawaii, it would go up and it would stop and it would probably end up moving sideways and nothing would melt. So, what if we had really hot mantle? Um, yeah, if, if we had mantle that was, say, 1600 degrees C, and we come up following that adiabatic decompression path, we're going to hit the solidus. We hit it really deep here. We hit it about 5 gigapascals, so this is about 150 kilometers. We can actually get a fair bit of melting by the time we hit that thick lithosphere. So... If we have anomalously hot mantle under Hawaii, it is possible to get melting, but we need a way to explain this. So an important thing 
uh, kind of a, a clue to what's going on with Hawaii, and, and maybe you've seen this in previous courses, is that Hawaii is not just this little set of islands. Um, it's actually part of this huge chain um, that extends a long way across the Pacific. Now, if we look at the actual islands, they get older towards the northwest. So the newest active volcanism is actually underwater. It's in this uh, volcano called Loihi that's off the coast. And it's, not, it, it's basically growing a volcano on the seabed, but it's not grown big enough to pop up above the surface yet. The most active volcano that's above, uh, well, I think it might just be the most active one in general, is Kilauea. That's in the southeastern corner of the big island. And that's basically been erupting for like 40 years straight. I think it took a break last year after it had a really big eruption, but this, this is a really active volcano. Then we have Mauna Loa. I think it's this one here, Mauna Kea. And then in the older islands, you can see that the, sorry, the, the islands to the northwest, you can see the ages, which are these numbers, are actually getting older. And as we go northwest, these islands get smaller and more eroded. So Haleakala, which is the other one I showed you pictures from, is on Maui. Uh, Oahu, this is where like the big city Honolulu is in Hawaii, and it's actually uh, getting pretty flat. And out here in Kauai, it's, it's quite like a flat, tropical island. There's no massive volcanoes. If we follow back from Hawaii, you can actually see that this chain continues underwater, and these numbers are ages and millions of years, and you can see it getting older and older and older as we go out. Then there's kind of like a, an elbow, like a change in direction. And if we follow this all the way out, then the oldest sea mounts, they're called, because they're not islands, but they're still kind of, you know, visibly above the sea level, they're about 80 million years old. And then we actually lose track of the chain because it's getting subducted under the Aleutian Arc, which is between Alaska and Russia. So, okay, so we have this big chain of sea mounts. Right now, they're parallel to the Pacific plate motion. So the Pacific plate is moving that way to the northwest. It's subducting under Japan, under the Aleutians. And you can actually see all these on Google Earth. If you put it in satellite view and, and just look in the Pacific, you'll, you'll see them. Um, it's quite cool. You can, you can spot, have fun looking for seamount chains. All right, so the, the best explanation that, that we have for this at the minute is that uh, what's happening is as the Pacific plate moves, it's basically moving over a hot region of mantle. And this is sometimes described as a hot spot or a, a mantle plume. And as the plate keeps moving, we get new volcanoes formed at the front edge. So here's Loihi, that underwater one. The biggest or the most active volcanoes are supposedly right above the center of this plume. And as the plate continues to move, the volcanism dies down. We get less and less volcanism. And eventually, these older ones are all essentially volcanically dead. They're done erupting. We're too far away from the hotspot. Okay. So that was, that was it for that section. Uh, Hawaii, really volcanically active. It's far away from plate boundaries and the lithosphere is thick. Um, so you can't melt normal temperature mantle there. Um, we need higher temperatures and the best explanation for this is a mantle plume that's basically been dropping this chain of islands as the Pacific plate moves over it. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, good. I think it was a bit, a bit more relaxed than phase diagrams and all that. So, um, sorry, I'm just checking the recording still going. Where did the top bit of the elbow come from? Yeah, so that's really interesting because if you if you just follow, if the Pacific plate motion had stayed the same, then you should just see a straight line, right? So at some point it curves, and I, I think the idea is that about 40 million years ago, which is where that change takes place, there was some change in the direction of Pacific plate motion. Um, some people say that this only needs a relatively minor change. Some people say it's like a kind of big tectonic rejigging where all the plates uh, change direction a bit. But yeah, essentially the motion changed. So we think about these um, mantle plumes being like relatively stationary and the plates are basic. The plates move very fast compared to the plumes. So it's like if you just had a, a, a single point and it's, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, we'll talk a bit about uh, mantle plumes and their relationship to ocean islands and large igneous provinces. So in terms of thinking about mantle convection and mantle plumes, um, one way we can think about the mantle is, is, is if it's a lava lamp. So it's being heated from below and 
what's happening is that basically this within the convecting mantle or the convecting lava lamp, the, the temperature is, is really pretty stationary. So if it was conducting, then we'd see this steady profile across it. But because it's convecting, it's, the, the temperature is only changing because of that adiabatic, you know, the pressure change. So basically, we can't really make a hot upwelling from the middle of the mantle because there's no extra temperature to do it with. So the only places that we can make big upwellings and downwellings is at the bottom, where it's being heated from the core mantle boundary. Uh, or at the top, you can make a downwelling because it's being cooled against the lithosphere and ultimately the crust. Right, so we call these boundary layers. So you can make, you can make a plume and upwelling at a boundary layer. And I've just got a little, well, it's not a little, I think it's like a four hour long video, but we're not going to watch the whole thing. <laughs> That's the rest of the lecture, it's just watching a lava lamp. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so I picked this spot because I think there was a pretty good plume. So we can see we have a blob that's starting to rise up here. This one never really made it. Here, this is a blob of hot wax. You see how it's got this kind of mushroom head shape, right? It's, it, it's because we need a bit of extra energy to kick it off, and then the stuff following behind can actually move up easier because it's like this has broken a pathway through. So we have these blobs coming up. Now in the mantle, they don't break off into bubbles like that, but it's the same idea as we have this kind of like, it, here basically what's happening is it's, it's getting hotter and it's getting less dense and it's getting ready to break away from this boundary layer where it's being heated. And then once it does, you have a big blob breaking off and a bunch of stuff falling behind. All right, so that's the mantle. Job done. <laughs> Oops. All right, so where are these boundary layers in the Earth's mantle? Um, this, this figure's a bit messy, but it probably showed like the most clear explanation of this I could find. So you can basically ignore all of the text on here. Three things we care about. Uh, this, this is kind of like a traditional view of a mantle plume. And so the two boundary layers we can use, we could either have something happening at the core mantle boundary, and this is because we have such a, a crazy temperature step from the core, which is really, really hot, and the mantle, which is still really hot, but not, not quite as hot. And then there's also this boundary layer um, at the base of the upper mantle. And this is because the lower mantle has quite different mineralogy, and it's much more viscous than the upper mantle. So we can either have plumes that form at the core mantle boundary, they break off, and they come all the way up. Or, and I think this is probably more like what a lot of the modern views are, we have these big plumes that form in the lower mantle, they kind of move upwards, then they stall against the upper mantle, lower mantle boundary, but then they're basically heating the base of the upper mantle. And so from there, we'll have little plumes popping up. Um, upper mantle. Yeah, yeah. Now, for, for, for your guys' purposes, you can treat the upper mantle and lower mantle as being made of the same stuff. It's got the same composition. The big change here is mineralogical. Um, we won't worry about that too much. This one, I, I think these Andersonian plumes, these are for people who don't really believe that thermal plumes exist, and so they would argue that there's a plume isn't that there's hot mantle, but there's different composition mantle. But we're not gonna worry about that too much. Okay, so what happens when a mantle plume arrives? So remember back to our lava lamp, we have that big mushroom head and then it sort of broke off, but in the mantle, we're gonna say that a little tail follows it. So if we wanted to see what happens when a plume arrives, theoretically we could follow these uh, ocean island chains back and find the start when, when the plume first got there. So yeah, with Hawaii, I've already kind of outlined the problem is that we follow this back and it just ends up in a subduction zone. So we can't see what kicked off the volcanism that's going on at Hawaii today. But there are other island chains that we can follow back. And what's quite cool is with, with several of these, um, we actually find something called a large igneous province at the start. And I'll go into that on, on the next couple of slides. But I just want to stress here, not every single ocean island on the planet needs a mantle plume. There's some which are like, they're very small, you know, just like a little sea mount or something. It doesn't have one of these time progressive chains like we see at Hawaii. And we're not going to worry about those. We're going to worry about the big ones where we can see a nice big chain. 
So this is the Réunion hotspot, which is another gorgeous tropical island in the Indian Ocean. And if you follow it back in time, it's actually broken here by a mid-ocean ridge. But you can actually follow this all the way back to the Deccan Traps in India. And the Deccan Traps are this huge, huge outpouring of basalt, and the timing lines up really well with the uh, dinosaur extinction, the, the KEPG boundary. And so some people have argued that there was also an effect from volcanism from the Deccan Traps, as well as the uh, asteroid, the meteorite impact that, that killed the dinosaurs. Another example is this uh, Tristan de Kuna hotspot. Uh, this is in the South Atlantic, and what's cool here is the hotspot's kind of on the, on the ridge, right? And so there's some islands here that are still volcanically active. And you can follow back these twin ridges in either direction. One goes to South America, where you have the, the Paraná. Um, again, this is one of these huge basalt provinces. And over here in Africa, you have the Etendeka. So these were probably originally one big igneous province that got split. And as the ocean moved apart, we made these ridges on either side of volcanoes. And the last one, and uh, probably more familiar to you guys, is Iceland. Uh, Iceland is still really, really volcanic, uh, volcanically active. Again, it's a, it's a bit more complicated because it does sit on a, on a mid-ocean ridge. It sits on the North Atlantic Ridge. But if we follow this back, this kind of time progression, and close up the Atlantic Ocean, we can see that there's these big volcanic provinces in West Greenland, in East Greenland, on the British Isles, and on the Faroe Islands. Um, so this is the North Atlantic Igneous province. Um, and then as the Atlantic has spread, and it's not been spreading super fast, um, we have these big volcanic ridges between the Faroes and Iceland, and between Greenland and Iceland. Yeah? How did they get over to West Greenland? Yeah, so this is, um, this is kind of like where people have reconstructed the, the mantle plume location. So the idea was that it, it was initially under West Greenland. But because on this diagram it looks like the plume is moving, but we have to remember the plume's not moving much. It's the continents that are doing most of the moving. So basically Greenland moved over the mantle plume. So over time we went from having only magmatism on West Greenland to magmatism in East Greenland and the Faroes and then eventually to Iceland. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, quite possibly. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. So, I mean, that would make sense if you keep following this onwards. Yeah. Um, the, it, the plumes aren't completely stationary and it's actually quite difficult to predict how a plate's going to move. But yeah, if it, if it keeps going, it will, it will end up here. Denmark will finally have some interesting uh, geography, so, <laughs> and uh, it'll be easier for you guys to stay in a job as uh, igneous geochemists. So, yeah, it's not long, not long now. Um, so, what are these large igneous provinces? Um, so, these are defined as it's just these huge accumulations of igneous rock. So, the kind of official boundary is a, a hundred thousand kilometers cubed. So, this is just like a vast amount of, of uh, igneous rock. And they're often erupted very, very rapidly in less than two million years. So a lot of these are often associated with extinction events. Um, I mentioned the Deccan Traps. That's around the time that the dinosaurs became extinct, and some people think it's the cause. If you're producing all this lava and, and all this magma, there's also a lot of volcanic gas coming off it. So it can really mess up the climate. It can uh, you know, cause mass extinctions. The big one, um, the, the Permian-Triassic boundary, which was about 250 million years ago, and I think you might have studied at some point. So that, you know, 95% of life on Earth was wiped out, and that is associated with another large igneous province, that's the, uh, the Siberian traps in, uh, in Russia. So yeah, on continents we get these thick piles of, it's pretty monotonous, like boring looking basalt. Um, and these are sometimes referred to as continental flood basalts. So I got a couple of examples from the pharaohs. And you can see here these cliffs. You see these big lines going across the cliffs. Every one of these divides a lava flow. So I, I'm not quite sure how, how tall this cliff is, but it's probably at least a couple hundred meters. And it's just stacks of basalt, basalt, more basalt, more basalt um, in these big, big lava flows. There's some sheep uh, appreciating the geology in this one as well. And you can see again these lines and steps across it. Each one of those corresponds to like a big, big lava flow. 
So. And you can kind of sum this up with its plume heads or tails hypothesis. I know I said it as a hypothesis because I don't think everyone agrees on this, but I, I think it's, this is a really good explanation and it's, and it's the one that you guys are going to learn. So the idea is that just like our lava lamp, we have that big mushroom shaped blob coming up. Um, and essentially it's because you need a lot of temperature. This, this hot stuff here is, is not very viscous, right? Because it's hotter than the stuff around it. So you need a lot of excess temperature to kind of punch up through that cooler mantle. And so you get a big blob shaped head. But then once you've broken a pathway, the hot mantle beneath it only has to move up through the, the path that's already been cleared by this big head. So we get this big mushroom shaped head and a tail following. When this head impacts, um, we get a lot of volcanism. We get a lot of magma being produced. And this is our large igneous province. But once that uh, volcanism from the head has died down, we carry on having this rising plume tail. And as plates move across it, we get a volcanic chain. And this will be our ocean island basalt. So go ahead. So continental plates move faster than the tail would. No, this, so this is un, this this is unrelated to the to the plate motion. Okay. It's just uh, so the, the the plume kind of like bursts upwards. You get this huge amount of magnetism, and then the the plates just the plates probably you know the plate motion can be affected by plumes, but in general you can think of it as a plate is just sat there moving over it. It's just that because this you're getting a huge amount of hot material coming in a relatively short space of time mm -hmm. that we get our flow basalts. Yeah, but since yeah. you have the volcanic trail, yeah. the plate has managed to move those three volcanoes before the rising plume tail has completely rised up. Um, it's more of like a continuous process. Okay. So this, you know, as, so it, as soon as the head is impacted, you've still got a tail coming up. Okay. So we don't, we don't have a time axis in this diagram. We don't really know how long. This, this is just schematic. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I guess one thing that I might talk about next week if we have a chance is sometimes these huge plume events, they actually start the breakup of oceans. So, you know, we see this Iceland plume arriving and then the North Atlantic starts opening afterwards. You see the Tristan de Kuna plume arriving and the South Atlantic starts opening shortly after that. So they, they probably have some effect on, on, on continents breaking up. But yeah. Okay. That was it. Um, yeah, so mantle convection, lava lamp, that's easy to, easy to think of. Um, we have our hot rising plumes, they can only originate from boundary layers on Earth, that's either the core mantle boundary or it's the mantle transition zone. Um, when these plumes first reach the shallow upper mantle, we get a huge amount of melting and this causes a large igneous province, this is the plume head. And then when the plume continues to ascend, we get a hotspot track, that's the plume tail. Um, I put the reading for this week a slide earlier because I forgot about it last time. Um, textbook, chapters 3 and 4, and appendix B. And then there's winter chapter 8 that I put on the Absalon. And then really recommend this open geology textbook chapter. Um, yeah, so that's it. There's the lecture summary. Does anyone have any questions about any of that? Or are you all keen to get out here? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Great.